All right, I think we've reached a critical mass. Um, so I would like to introduce Camilla, the co-coordinator of the Alliance um, to kick off this webinar. Thank you so much, Camilla. Hello, and another good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be able to welcome you to today's webinar to launch the Toolkit for Community Child Protection Volunteers. Uh, so I'm Camilla Jones, the co-coordinator of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. This is the body under which this incredibly important work was brought together. This is a much needed resource. It builds on learning from over a decade of work on understanding the essential roles of community volunteers and how they're a bridge to quality and effective case management. It brings together a wealth of practical and useful tools, such as a code of conduct and a role description for volunteers, a selection tool and a budget checklist. These can be used in programmes with very little adaptation to improve the experience for staff, volunteers, and the children and communities they support. A big thanks and a good dose of respect goes to all those involved in this excellent piece of work. We'd like to extend a big thank you to Plan International USAID, USA for leading on behalf of the Alliance and USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance for generously funding it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Camilla, for kicking us off on such a wonderful note. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Michelle, and I work with Plan International as a child protection specialist. Uh, I will be your moderator for today. Um, please feel free to drop your name, position, where you're calling in from in the chat so we can know who we're uh, speaking with. Um, today, we have three goals for this uh, event. First, we would like to present the toolkit and training manual on engaging community volunteers in case management. Um, second, we'd like to share how different components of the resources were used in Malawi, Nigeria, and Mozambique. And third, we would like to share how different stakeholders can use the toolkit and training manual for their own programming. Um, before we begin, I'd like to take care of just some housekeeping. Um, we are recording the webinar and it will be shared along with the links to the key documents with all participants and the documents and the webinar recording will be up on the Alliance website following the event. Um, we have a Q&A box that you can use to ask any questions you may have for our presenters. You can also put any questions that you have in the chat. We will be monitoring them closely um, and hopefully have time to answer some questions from participants at the end of this uh, launch. Um, with that, I would like to introduce Beth Drevlo, um, Humanitarian Protection Advisor with the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance for some opening remarks. Um, thank you, Beth. Michelle, and thank you, Camilla. Not hearing me ping me, and I, I will turn off. I'm realizing that I'm as I'm listening to you. On behalf of BHA, very excited to participate in this launch of the very critical toolkit for community child protection volunteers. And firstly, I would really like to specifically thank those who were a part of creating this launch. Um, this was done in association with the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action and its members invaluable support, including out of the two task forces, the community level task force and the case management task force. So thank you to the Alliance and all the members who've been a part. Also, this was completed, supported and advised by the Interagency Review Committee and by active participation from development and humanitarian organizations, both INGOs and NGOs. A massive thank you as well. And of course, we thank the volunteers and the organizations who are part of the field pilots in Nigeria, Mozambique, Malawi, and Burma or Myanmar. And your effort was absolutely extraordinary to make sure that this toolkit came into being. And finally, and most passionately, we thank Plan International USA, specifically Colleen Fitzgerald and Michelle Van Aken. Thank you for your long hours and all your effort and all of your team's effort and creative thinking to bring forth a toolkit that represents standards we hope will influence our work through volunteers in years to come. As a child protection community, we recognize the invaluable role that volunteers play in supporting children and communities in need. And this toolkit and the standards laid out is intended to honor and value 
the time and effort of such volunteers and set standards to ensure that while we continue to promote the spirit of volunteerism, we do not in any way overstep in our expectations of those volunteers. We know that volunteers sit in this very precarious position at times. They live in the community and hence they are best suited to know the needs of those in the community and they are the quickest to reach those in need. At the same time, by living in the community, they themselves are experiencing the same risks and issues faced. And by providing care, they are often put under the strain of having a demand on them at all hours of the day and night, just by being there and being available. So we hope that this toolkit will support the appropriate use of volunteers, what is reasonable and fair, and what does not cause harm. And also, so what celebrates volunteers? We know that the questions asked during development of this tool were tough. We know that they touched on ethical considerations and we know that they brought under review the way that we've been working with volunteers for many years. We don't wanna make any assumptions, but rather in the use of this toolkit, we hope that um, we will see um, more ethical and sustainable processes um, in our use of volunteers and efforts that do not cause harm. And so as we roll out this toolkit today, we hope that organizations will use it to reform and review their own practices with volunteers and that it will be just a step in the process of recognizing the special role volunteers play in supporting children and communities and need. Back to you, Michelle. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Beth. And Beth, I'd like to thank you for your support throughout the development of these resources. To have your, your feedback and your support and your technical insight was really you know, helpful throughout the development of these resources. And I know that both Colleen and myself found it um, very useful. Um, so we will be hearing from four panelists today uh, who I am very excited to introduce. Um, first, we'll be hearing from Colleen Fitzgerald, who was the technical lead for the Community Engagement and Case Management uh, project. Um, so she fearlessly led this piece of work, which also brought her to question a lot of um, what she's, you know, her own approach to case management in the past. Um, we'll also be having Lara Adebowale, um, who led the piloting of the resources in Nigeria. Um, Bright Sabale, who led the piloting in Malawi, and Victoria Diliwayu, who works with Plan International in Mozambique and supported piloting in Mozambique. Um, with that, Colleen, can you share a bit about the background of these resources? Yes, absolutely. And thank you for the welcome, uh, Beth and Camilla and Michelle. I'm so excited for this event today. So in 2020, we conducted the Community Engagement and Case Management Study. And the aim of this study was to provide a better understanding of community volunteers who have responsibilities within the child protection case management process. So first we conducted a desk review and we looked at academic literature as well as grade literature, which included SOPs, guidelines, and trainings from a variety of NGOs um, doing child protection in both humanitarian and development settings. We also had 32 key informant interviews with academics, uh, child protection advisors, and child protection managers at the country level. And finally, we, in, we had field research conducted um, in both Myanmar and Malawi. And the field research included participatory workshops with volunteers themselves and key informant interviews with staff members and government representatives and UN agencies at the country level. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so over 100 volunteers were also included in the research. Um, we had volunteers submitting field narratives, their personal stories, and photos from over 20 countries around the world. So we really had a deep look um, from a wide variety of volunteers and a wide variety of perspectives. And what we learned from the study is that essentially there is a need for more critical thought about how volunteers are engaged and the nature of their relationships with child protection organizations. There are four key findings that 
really laid the foundation for the development of these resources that we're sharing today. So the first and very important finding was that community volunteers bring an enormous benefit. Um, community volunteer involvement in child protection responses, in fact, was shown to improve impact on children and families. Volunteers are ever present in the community and they have a deep understanding of the risk factors and natural resources that exist to keep children safe. The second finding is that community volunteers have deep personal motivations and they face complex realities. So volunteers decide to take on their roles for many different reasons. They're motivated by religious values, they're motivated by gender norms, and very often uh, a spirit and a passion to help children. And at the same time, they face very complex power dynamics within their communities and also with child protection organizations, which makes it difficult for them to um, express challenges or advocate for themselves. The third and really critical finding was that essentially expectations on volunteers are too high. Often volunteers with minimal literacy levels, very limited training and supervision are being expected to handle complex and high risk cases. And we found this particularly during the COVID-19 response. Um, very often volunteers have unclear roles and they're expected to work 24 seven for very minimal um, incentives or remuneration. And finally, the good news is that we, um, through the research, we found what works. There is evidence that informs what works when we are engaging with community volunteers um, and how to do this work ethically. And so these four key findings really informed the foundation of the toolkit and the training manual. Thank you so much, Colleen. Um, we will now hear from Bright. Bright, can you tell us a bit about what we learned from listening to volunteers in Malawi. In Malawi, I think building on what Colin has just presented, uh, what came up with as the lessons are, are clear, basically we learned uh, four things. Uh, the first one, Um, especially in the humanitarian context. I think Colin has also mentioned something related to that. Secondly, we learned about uh, volunteers and how they do their work and how, what they feel about their work, um, again, in the humanitarian context. Thirdly, we learned about how volunteers work with their implementing partner uh, organizational staff. So the interface, the power dynamics between volunteers and the partner staff. And lastly, we learned uh, about the challenges that we the work. Uh, most of them work without job description. They work for long hours, as Colin has said, uh, any structured incentives and often uh, their demands by the community are quite, quite high. So in summary, that's what we learned about uh, uh, volunteers in Malawi. All right, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much, Bright. Um, we also, as Colleen mentioned, collected testimonials from volunteers around the world. And what we would like to now do is share some of those testimonials um, from two volunteers in Malawi. So we will be hearing um, from Joyce Kagai and Wilongo Lukosi. From my experience, what I can say, I can say that frontiering is something sort of someone has. You have first to like what you do. And when you like what you do as a volunteer, then you have to motivate others. It's not like something that you people come and do this and this, but you yourself, you have to, to determine that, yes, I'm a volunteer and you pay for my community. The message that I wanted to give you is you have to think on us because we are working very hard. 
we are willing to work and then we will continue to work in order to save our community and then from this discussion we need the outcomes we need the changes from you you should not sleep you should wake up and understand for these volunteers who are working in the camp especially in malawi is like a refugee camp we need the changes um i think it's really great for us to be able to hear from volunteers themselves about their experiences why they're volunteering you know, and, and what the challenges they're facing are. Um, so I'm glad that we were able to share a couple of those um, testimonials with you. Right, can you tell us what steps were taken with the plan team and volunteers after the research? So after having these findings, what did we do next? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, after the, the, the study, we made obviously some recommendations and we, uh, the first step was to actually sit down with the plan international uh, and, and plan uh, and they designed participatory workshops with volunteers and plan staff. Uh, these are workshops which are basically validated the study findings, identified areas of action, and then um, uh, developed a plan. Um, then we created uh, as a second step, we created a task team. This is a, an implementation team, which was the, uh, composed of members of uh, plan Malawi staff and volunteers as a joint team for ownership and sustainability issues, uh, while I was providing the technical support to the task team. Well, as one of the outcomes of that task team and one uh, way of implementing the work plan, we actually developed a guidance note. This is more of a stage manual uh, for both volunteers and staff, uh, which plan Malawi volunteers are using now to mitigate some of the change from the volunteers. And of course, we have also institutionalized some of the recommendations, starting with the uh, volunteers there. So we celebrated together with volunteers and plan staff a volunteers day last year, 31st August, and that one will continue even this year and going on forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bright. Um, and thank you for all the work that you've put into this piece of work. Um, so what we'd like to know next, Colleen, is how did the field research influence the development of the toolkit and the training manual? And this actually will respond to one of the questions that we have in the chat already, which is, what state steps did you take before and during the preparation and development of training manuals for volunteers? Mm. Great, so thank you again. Uh, and thanks, Bright, for sharing the experience from Malawi. So this process that Bright described, this research and action process that were undertaken in the pilot countries was really the foundation of the toolkit and the training manual. And so Bright had mentioned this process of working with volunteers and staff together to address some of the issues. And that really is the spirit in which um, we really tried to develop resources to address some of the issues that were found. And so the toolkit and training manual for community child protection volunteers outlines ethical practice when engaging community volunteers in case management and is directly linked to the evidence as well as directly linked to the experiences that we had at the country level. The toolkit and training manual outlines standards um, that we agreed upon. You were on the right slide, that's <laughs> Kira, thank you. Um, the toolkit and training manual outline clear standards that have been agreed upon at the global interagency level around the roles of community volunteers and case management. And we really want to emphasize those together today. Firstly, um, it is important to clarify that the role of a caseworker who manages the six steps of the case management process, the documentation, et cetera, is a role for paid staff. Um, volunteers are an essential bridge and link to case management, but volunteers themselves who are from the community who are getting limited remuneration they should not be responsible for the full case management process. 
They play an essential role alongside caseworkers, including identifying and referring cases, following up on cases, especially in remote and hard to access settings, uh, accompanying children to services, interpretation. And in this role, community volunteers must have ongoing training, coaching, and supervision. Uh, they should have limited hours that they are expected to dedicate to their roles um, with the child protection organization. And finally, part of child protection organization's duty of care is to account for and promote and have practices in place for the safety and well being of community volunteers in their roles. So within the toolkit, we have six steps of ethical practice. And um, you might recognize that some of these steps are actually mirroring what we had done that Bright described in Malawi. So first we had um, a learning step or assessment and analysis step. Um, and in this step, what we really encourage for child protection organizations is to um, examine who are the community members who are already responding to children's needs, the natural helpers that exist within the community. And then also looking at um, what is the compensation or incentive policy for other NGOs and how might remuneration impact community volunteers well being and safety. These are some questions that should be asked with community volunteers in the first stage. And then from there in the decision making stage, the second step, um, we encourage child protection organizations to determine a fair compensation policy. And our advocacy is that a compensation policy for volunteers should be determined at an interagency level. Thirdly, we have the step on implementation. And this is where there's a lot of very practical guidance for child protection organizations. Um, ethical practices for identifying and selecting volunteers, um, how to work um, as a case management team in a remote setting, supervision, um, peer support for community volunteers to support one another, and finally, um, implementation guidance on protecting the safety and well being of volunteers. The fourth step on strengthening and developing community volunteers' capacity. Um, one of our key messages in this section is to link the training of volunteers to the broader work of developing the social service workforce. Um, the fifth step on monitoring, evaluation, accountability, and learning. We promote the establishment of feedback and reporting mechanisms for children and families, as well as for volunteers as members of the affected community themselves. And finally, in the advocacy step, um, we offer guidance and key messages for donors, country directors, governments, UN agencies, as well as coordination groups. And something that I'd like to really emphasize, um, and I think we tried to depict this in the icons that we have, is that volunteers should be involved in each of these six steps, um, working with volunteers um, in the decision-making process, in the advocacy process, um, their voices and their perspectives are essential in order for us to be successful. Also linked to the, uh, the toolkit are 15 uh, practical operational tools that we actually developed and have available as Word documents. So you can download them, translate them and adapt them for your context very easily. Um, and they're hyperlinked throughout the entire toolkit. Um, some of these tools include a volunteer role description or job description essentially for volunteers. Um, we have a code of conduct, we have a budget checklist. So when you're designing a program where volunteers are going to be involved, what are some really important um, things that you should be budgeting for, such as trainings um, and materials for them to be successful and safe in their work. So we really hope that these tools are also very practical and will help you immediately in your engagement with volunteers. Moving on to the training manual. Um, so the manual reflects exactly the same guidance that we outlined in the um, toolkit, but really helps to facilitate learning with volunteers and child protection teams. And the aim is really to build on the deep knowledge, capacities and resources of volunteers in order to enable them to ethically support child protection cases. Um, the sessions emphasize participatory approaches, there's contextualization tips, um, as well as learning objectives and evidence statements in each session. 
We also have detailed preparation guidance for facilitators, really fun icebreakers incorporated throughout the sessions, and simple feedback methods to make sure that we're listening to volunteers throughout the learning process. Within the training manual, there are three core sections. Um, and the first one is uh, uh, nine sessions based on the foundational learning for volunteers, which starts with listening to volunteers and um, understanding with them their knowledge, their expertise, and their motivations to come to their roles as volunteers. We really wanted to begin this training with appreciating that volunteers are not empty vessels that we need to fill with knowledge, but rather volunteers are coming with their own expertise and their own motivation and their own skills um, and, and really appreciating that from the very start. From there, we really build the understanding of volunteers' roles within their communities. And particularly then we focus on the roles of volunteers within case management, um, really being that link between children and families and um, the caseworker. Uh, we have sessions on safety and well-being, as well as in the last session we have caseworkers or child protection staff and volunteers come together to reflect on their complementary roles um, and really celebrate that we're better together as volunteers and caseworkers. Part two are, are just a few supplementary sessions that can add to the foundation. So we have sessions on communication with children, with caregivers, as well as a session on power dynamics. And then finally, we have part three, which is uh, trainings for the case management team. There's a session particularly on interpretation to offer guidance for caseworkers and volunteers together to understand their um, respective and complementary roles when they're interpreting, in, interpreting within case management, which I think is a, a really high demand, so uh, should be helpful. And then finally, we have sessions on risks and power dynamics for staff. So it's a very comprehensive training, really setting the standards and maintaining them and socializing them among child protection teams and volunteers. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Colleen. Um, it, I can speak from having supported this project that it is an extremely comprehensive training manual that is as um, user-friendly as possible. Um, I think it was a really innovative approach to how can we ensure capacity strengthening um, without relying too heavily on technology. Um, so I, I really encourage everyone to take a look at the training manual. Um, I, Victoria, um, would you share with us some of the participatory learning modalities that you tested with Colleen in Mozambique as part of the pilot piloting? Because I know that part of this what was so important was making sure that we were involving community volunteers in these trainings and learning from them as well. So what are some of these participatory methods that we tested? Uh, good morning or good, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I will take you through uh, the main participatory methodologies um, that we used here um, in Mozambique during the piloting of the, of the toolkit. And also, let me also say it was really an honor for Mozambique to be selected uh, as one of the countries where the toolkit was, um, was uh, piloted. Um, and before I take you through uh, the, the five methodologies, um, let me also share with you that um, the training during the five days, we did not even have any PowerPoint presentation. It was highly participatory and the community volunteers really liked the, the, the training. So let me take you through uh, these five participatory uh, methodologies. Uh, we have mapping at the beginning of the training uh, with the community volunteers, which was really helpful. Uh, most times when we are talking about community volunteers, uh, we tend to think uh, that uh, they are individuals, they are people who do not even uh, come um, into the work of child protection with uh, anything to, to, to contribute. But when they were um, doing the exercise on body mapping, they were able to see the value that they bring um, in this work on uh, of child protection, 
uh, the skills that they already uh, possess, the motivation that they already have in terms of working with, um, with children. It was really, really um, helpful and also too easy um, to put the community volunteers at easy during the five days of, of the training, knowing that they are a valuable um, asset in terms of working with uh, children in the, in the communities. Next slide, please. Um, during the, the, the training, we also um, worked uh, with community volunteers uh, for them to do community mapping, which was really very helpful in terms of them identifying the services, the service providers that are available in, in their communities. Let me also share that uh, most of the community volunteers that we worked with um, are from the IDP communities and they were new in the communities they, they were staying. Then the community mapping exercise really helped them to uh, sort of appreciate some of the services that are available, the service providers as well, that are available in terms of um, serving as um, a net for child protection in their communities. Thank you, next. Um, it was also exciting um, during the, the, the training uh, to have um, key learning cards that um, were prepared ahead of um, the sessions. Uh, the key learning cards, they were the most exciting thing about them. They were translated um, into, into Portuguese, even all the, um, the trainings, they took place in, um, in Portuguese. Uh, the small cards were also laminated uh, and at the end of the training, the communities took the cards with them uh, to their communities, uh, which uh, is serving up to now as some reference guides when they need to, to consult important information uh, in relation to the training, in relation to their work, in, in relation to some concepts that are involved in, um, in child protection. Um, they, they have part of the, the, the resources they can run to. Um, when we are not present in the in the communities, they really liked these um, the the cards. They had a very beautiful ring to put them together so that they will not um, lose them. Thank you. Next, um, we are uh, during the, the 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 training. Colleen also um, she brought uh, some yeah some examples from other countries um, on the work that community volunteers. Um, are, are doing. We had some, some illustrations of the work that community volunteers are doing in other countries. Um, these um, served as like um, modeling. If we, if we look uh, at what's uh, happening on the, on the illustrations, modeling the, the, the skills uh, that would want the community volunteers to, to possess, communication skills, how they are supposed to, to be interacting. Um, with the children in their communities, with the caregivers in the in the communities, uh, this was actually really helpful for them to see how other community volunteers are doing their their work um, in different countries. Thank you. Um, then um, we also had uh, some drawings. Um, it's actually very, a sensitive, um, a sensitive part of the training when we requested the community volunteers to identify and to talk about some of the risks that they, they face in their, in their communities. Um, I think if we did not have this exercise of like having them drawing the risks, we were not going to, to get maybe as many risks, um, we got during the, during the training. We can see, for those who can see the, the, the drawings, uh, the community volunteers, they, they fear that at times they can get, uh, their houses can be burnt down due to the sensitivity of the, um, of the nature of child protection. We have people who are violating children's rights in the, in the communities. So in a bid um, to, to try to, um, to, try to, um, to destroy, a, a time, some evidence, they will be able to, or they may decide to go and threaten the, the community volunteers 
they also they also shared that at times uh, they can uh, they receive in, uh, insults or they get insulted when they do like community um, um, home visits because uh, the community will be expecting at times that the the volunteers the community volunteers will bring like some food handouts to them but they go to to visit to listen to them but for the community they did not really they do not really place a lot of value on on that so these are we had lots of um of um risks that way that we discussed during during the training where um we are really supposed to to be um cognizant of this when we are working that even though they are from those communities but there are a lot of risks that uh, they face in their respective um communities it was really an uh, uh, exciting uh, exciting training we benefited a lot together with the community volunteers um thank you very much and over to you michelle thank you We learned as part of the project team was just the very real risks that community volunteers can face, you know, trying to support children um, within their communities. And I think it's something that we hadn't necessarily critically thought about before. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, Lara, if you were going to give advice to somebody who was going to train community volunteers using this training manual, um, what would be like your key pieces of, of advice from your experience piloting this with two INGOs in Nigeria? Okay, um, thank you everyone just knowing from here in Nigeria. Um, I want to say again that it's a privilege to be here, possibly the second time or maybe the third. And I appreciate this opportunity to share with us our experience in Nigeria with um, the trainings and the toolkits. If I'm going to advise any organization who will be using these toolkits on how to use the toolkit, I'm going to say that this toolkit is, is in English. So it means that organizations who are using them have to translate them into the local language. So the use of local language is very important from our experience here in Nigeria in the North East Nigeria, Maiduguri precisely, where the um, research work was done and where we, where we um, piloted the, the toolkit. Um, Hausa is the predominant language here. And because of that, we had to um, translate the toolkit to the local language. We got a translator, we translated the toolkit. And even before we started to use the toolkit or before we piloted the toolkit, we had to take this took you through the translated um, took you through a review with the managers of the organizations that we are implementing the research work with. They had to review it, and um, we agreed on the common terms of some sensitive words that have been translated, and then we were able to use the toolkit, um, pilot the toolkit. By using it to train the volunteers. And that was a very good experience for us. So number one, it's very important that um, the toolkits are translated into the local language of whichever country um, is the, the toolkit is going to be used. And secondly, um, I would also say that it is important that um, summary cards uh, are used. We did that during the training. We had summary cards that stated clearly the summary of each of the topics. And um, we, we had that um, tax together with it's it's it sat really well with them because it was something they they refer to it. So I would advise that organizations who are using this toolkit can, apart from after um, training these people or training the volunteers on the toolkit, they can have this stack of cards that we call the summary card. It will really go a long way for the volunteers. 
And also during the training, we, we did what we call the use of stories. You discover that sometimes when volunteers have been trained, they most of the time they are not able to connect what they have been trained in the four walls of the training hall. They are not able to connect it with what is the realities on the field. And so what we did then was to come up with stories, real time stories, practical stories, things that they expect to see on the field. Yes, of course, without breaking confidentiality, just coming up with those stories as what they would see on the field and helping them to analyze those stories. They used those stories for practical sessions. They were able to analyze this and that's where the knowledge sat well with them. And they also gave feedback that, that those stories really helped them to understand exactly what we're saying about each of those topics. So I would say to organizations who are using these toolkits to come up with stories, depending on the context, what applies in Nigeria might not apply in Mozambique, might not apply in different countries. So you look at your context, look at what applies in your context, look at some of the, um, the issues that have been coming up around case management and bring them up as practical stories. Of course, maintaining confidentiality, bring them up as practical stories, use them to train these people. And when they get to the field, they will be able to connect the dots. So these are some of the, um, the, the, the advice I'm going to give to organizations. So like I said, one, use local language. It is very, very important for volunteers to understand. Number two, use summary cards. Summary cards that explains in summary what they have learned from each of the sessions. And then number three, use practical stories during the training so that they understand this well. And when they get out there, they can connect the dots. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lara. And thank you so much for all of your support throughout um, this project. Um, so Colleen, you know, I know that, you know, it has been two years of, of working on and developing this resource. Um, what comes next? Great question. Uh, and thank you so much, Victoria and Lara, for sharing so much of your experience. Um, so what comes next? Right now, the resources exist in English. So we're working on translating um, them into French. And we're hoping also to have a launch in French once, those, uh, once the materials are translated. We're also exploring the possibility of getting the resources translated into Spanish and Arabic as well. And further, we're hoping for additional funding to continue this work. I think this was really just the beginning of um, understanding how we can do better when engaging community volunteers in humanitarian responses. And so what we're really hoping to come next is to disseminate these resources beyond a webinar, to really socialize the guidance and training. And also we're hoping that we can have a part two. You'll notice that these resources are labeled as part one. We're hoping with a part two, we, could in, we can outline the ethical engagement of volunteers beyond case management. Um, so really looking at all of the various roles that community volunteers play um, in prevention and response. Um, so those are some of the things that we're hoping for. I'd like to say for any of you who are with us today who want to use the resources, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and I'd be really open to, um, if you want to email me, I'll drop my email in the chat. Uh, we're really excited to get these resources out into the world, and we'd love to hear um, how you're using them, things that are challenging, questions, etc. So we're really excited to hear from you. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Colleen. Um, we'll now move on to a broader Q&A with all of our panelists. Um, so the first question, and I, I have to agree that this is a, a really primary concern when it comes to working with volunteers is, um, you know, what, an important issue is the individual and collective commitment of volunteers, um, and to avoid, to avoid any expectations of benefits or remuneration and any frustration linked to the difference in status between professionals and volunteers. So I suppose um, the essence of the question here is how do, do you have an approach to evaluate and measure this criteria? When is, a, when is a role a volunteer role and when does it cross that line into being a, a staff role? Um, and how can we avoid this frustration or this feeling of 
exploitation related to remuneration um, for volunteers um, who may be doing more than what would a, a typical volunteer role would entail. Um, and Colleen, I know that this was something that we you know, struggled with a lot over the, the course of the project. So I'd love to hear from you on this one first. Thanks, Michelle. So I think I captured the question. <laughs> um, I think it's important that we distinguish volunteering from work. And the role of a volunteer means that there should be choice involved, there should be limited expectations, there should be limited hours and responsibilities. And the sense of a volunteer is doing this work um, out of uh, a desire to, to support their community. <clears throat> and thus, uh, we should be really careful on the amount of um, expectations and the responsibilities. Now, very often, um, volunteers are working in um, very difficult circumstances. Sometimes they're working in refugee settings in which there is no right to work. And obviously, we know that this is very complicated. Um, and so we need to agree at an interagency level in some of those contexts, what are the fair expectations that, um, that we can agree to together on the roles and responsibilities of volunteers while still allowing them opportunities for livelihoods. Um, so this is why we need to have limits and we also need to be able to really promote uh, them being able to receive um, fair <laughs> compensation according to those roles. Thank you so much, Colleen. And I, I know this is a tricky question that um, we had to really spend time thinking about throughout the project. Um, we've had a couple of questions around, you know, keeping volunteers motivated. So fr from Facebook, we had a comment saying that um, they have, you know, somebody who commented on Facebook said they have over 144 community volunteers and have difficulty motiv motivating them over longer term responses. So how can their engagement be enhanced um, or how can we help keep volunteers motivated? And I'd actually be really interested to hear from Lara, Victoria and Bright about based off of their experience working so closely with volunteers, what they would recommend. Um, so maybe we can go to Victoria first. Um. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the question on how we can uh, keep volunteers, uh, volunteers motivated. Uh, I think as Colin has mentioned, there's really need um, uh, for partners, interagency partners to, to really agree on the modalities of working with, uh, with volunteers because at times um, we find some uh, that different agencies can be in the same communities at the same time and things if they are not done in a coordinated manner, then it sort of uh, creates some some problems and some some challenges. Uh, and the the other ways, apart from the coordination between the the, the partners, or um, uh, it's also like um, constant uh, training so that they they are kept um, up to date with uh, what will be what will be um, happening. Also acknowledging their their work. Uh, the supportive, the different kinds of um, support supervision as well. It also helps to to motivate some of the some of the volunteers. So maybe at times people will be working or organizations will be working with pay or uh, like volunteers with a like uh, minimum um, stipends. Even when maybe leaving the project has come to an end, they they can continue to be in touch when they are. When they are motivated, they can phone. They can even request, "We want to do this. Where can we report this?" So we see that that long relationship, not like to to help them, like we are now leaving the volunteers without like constantly like following up on their on their work, developing that relationship, and also really explaining clearly um, the things to to the volunteers. Not like having that uh, relationship. You say we are. Or maybe one can say we are a little bit above and no to really establish like working relationships where respect is mutual. Thank you. 
Thank you, Victoria. I think that's such an important point about, around mutual respect with volunteers. Um, Bright, would you share with us some of your thoughts from your experience in Malawi and how we can best keep volunteers motivated? Thank you very much, Michelle. I think he, most of the points have been raised by my colleagues, but let me just add a few. And, and the first one for me is uh, how, how do we recruit our volunteers? Um, in some cases, we have noted that the, uh, volunteers are recruited as if they are recruited for employment. So you flash an advert, you, you, you project a, a narrative as if they are going to be applying for a job. I think we need to put in mechanisms. I think we have explained in the manual uh, how best to do it. There should be clarity in terms of what is expected of the volunteers. And that is done normally in the job description or in the terms of reference. So how you recruit them is very important. Um, they need to be credited in terms of what they are expected to do and also to receive in, in, in view of their role. But also I think Victoria mentioned about the mutual respect. We found that that is a very important narrative. Um, the power dynamics, we need to manage that to ensure that we continuously engage volunteers in all aspects of their work. Uh, of course, the other element related to that is the ongoing capacity building. So we need to have a plan in terms of how, uh, how, uh, how we continuously support them with skills and basic, very basic support like stationary, basic equipment and all that uh, on an ongoing basis. So maybe those are the points that I can add. Thank you, Bray. And just being mindful of time, um, I think there's this one, there's one question that I'd like to ask. Um, Lara, this is gonna be a question for you. How do you think volunteers, you know, how are volunteers themselves supported and supervised to manage and avoid secondary trauma? So as you know, these are community volunteers supporting case management. Um, it can be extremely um, heavy work. Um, so how can they best be supported um, and supervised to manage or avoid secondary trauma? Yes, thank you very much. It was a really interesting time working with the volunteers and I honestly gained a lot and I'm going to be sharing a few points right here. So maybe I should start with the initial question that you asked because I already made some comments on the, on the, on the group. I already answered um, the question. So maybe I should start from there and then it will bring me to the one you just asked now. So number one, I'm going to say that it's important to recognize the little efforts of community volunteers. Community volunteers are doing a great work. They are our entry points to the community. They, are, they help us identify cases that we wouldn't have been able to identify that would have been buried by community members if not for these community members, community volunteers who are part of them, who knows these things and who will tell us, who gives us heads up we would not have been able to rescue many children if volunteers are not there. So these guys are doing a great job and we just must recognize their efforts. And that's where it starts from because when you don't appreciate people, they feel downcast, they feel like they're not even doing anything while they are doing a lot of things. And that way they can be traumatized. So recognizing their efforts is one big way to motivate them and also helping them to avoid secondary trauma. Then I also stated here that we need to pay attention to their vulnerabilities and their mental health. These volunteers have, some of them, most of them are IDPs who have experienced one traumatic experience or the other. Some of them have been displaced. Some of them, their children are lost. Some of them, things that are happening to the children, we want them to help us identify have happened to them or somebody close to them. And so when they identify this kind of children, it could open up old wounds in them. And sometimes we don't get to realize this. We don't get to, re we don't get to notice this. We just see them as people that we are paying stipend. After all, we are paying you your responsibility is to identify cases for us. And if you are not identifying cases, we just think that they're not working. So it's for us to know that the daily cases, the cases of vulnerable children that these people are listening to every day, or they get to hear before they tell us, these things could end up traumatizing them. So it means that when we are planning for mental health for beneficiaries. We should look at these people also as part of our beneficiaries because the fact that they are volunteering with us does not mean that they have stopped being a part of the vulnerable community. 
They have only been strong themselves. They have only been trying to build their own resilience. And that's why they've come up to say, let us come out to support other people. But what happens is that organizations end up, you know, forgetting about these people. They end up forgetting that volunteers are first vulnerable people, part of the vulnerable community that ought to be targeted by the community. And that's why sometimes we even delay in giving them their stipend. And sometimes, even when we are when we are distributing of organizations who are into livelihoods, we don't consider them. We take all this life. In fact, we even send them to go and distribute or to give these livelihoods to other people, and they go and do it with integrity, but they don't get to get, and they are suffering. So it's important for organizations to look at the vulnerabilities of their own volunteers. Charity, they say, begins at home, look at your, the vulnerabilities of your volunteers. Stop considering them as staff that you are paying. They are not, we don't consider them as staff. And if they are staff, are we paying them exactly how much we are paying our staff? So if you're not paying them exactly how much we are paying our staff and we expect them to work as staff and we don't consider them for other things. And let me make this clear that sometimes when they go out to volunteer for us, for our organizations and working for other people, some distributions can be done within the community that they don't get to benefit from, they lose out from those things. And eventually they still come at loss and we don't still pay them their stipends sometimes. So I'm going to also mention that their stipends should be paid regularly. It's very important because when you don't pay people stipend, they don't have anything to feed their children. They will go back to start to think and that will lead to secondary trauma. Then we need to work with them as a team. One, two, one more point, we need to work with them as a team, it's important. So from my experience, this, um, the volunteers made, those, made it clear to us that when they are being treated like just people from the community who has nothing to offer, who are just there to identify cases, they don't feel um, confident enough to express themselves. They don't feel, you know, some, I had that some organizations, I don't know, maybe in Nigeria or shut out their, 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 even their volunteers are not even able, allowed to enter into the organizations. So these are some of the things we need to do. Treat them with respect, treat them like a team, make them part of your decision-making body. At least there are some levels of decisions they can make. And that's where you will see that these people will be happy with the work that they are doing. They will be able to better support children and they will not get to secondary trauma. Pay their stipends as and when due. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lara. Those are some really powerful points. Um, Colleen, I know that the past two years working on this project have been a personal journey for yourself as well as a professional one. Um, I would like to wrap up with hearing some of your reflections on what you've learned this past two years. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you so much for my co-panelists who have really inspired me through this process. I've learned so much um, from Bright, from Lara, from Victoria, and from the members of the review committee. Um, I just wanted to share that when we started this project, I had a limited understanding of volunteers. And, you know, in the early days when we were conducting focus group, dis uh, focus group discussions and key informant interviews, we noticed that there were a lot of people referring to how we use volunteers. Volunteers do this for us. Volunteers do that for us. And there was a lot of description of volunteers in terms of their function and really as a transactional relationship. So for me, I, I really began to reflect on the issues related to volunteers and my personal assumptions of how volunteers are engaged when they themselves are displaced as refugees or IDPs. And who are volunteers really serving? At the same time, you know, we were facing the Black Lives Matter movement, there were uprisings against racial injustice and inequality, which I think are at the center of these issues that we have with volunteers. And all of this really caused me to question, are we as humanitarians living by our values? The values of equity, of rights, of dignity, and the worth of the individual. When we are using people from the community who have no other livelihood options, giving them overwhelming amounts of work and putting them at risk. Where are we crossing the line to exploitation and taking advantage of people in a very vulnerable position? All of this really made me question my own privilege and my role and my place in this work. And am I perpetuating this colonial system of driving the work from my perspective? 
and who is this really benefiting? Truthfully, I had to reckon a lot with these questions and I really have been changed from this project and from this process. And we really have tried to create these resources in this direction to be people-centered and relationship-centered in the ways that we're engaging volunteers. Just as Laura has mentioned, we need to honor the lives of the people doing their work, the motivations and their deep cultural understanding. We need to create the space to see them as people who deserve to be safe and uh, appreciated within teams and within their communities. Everything we try to achieve in our work as child protection actors is through the hands of volunteers. And the way that we engage with them directly relates to our ability to serve children. So I wanna close by inviting all of you to join me in this process, to join us in this process, to reimagine our relationships with volunteers and communities. And we might be at many different stages in this process and certainly we have a long way to go. But I believe together we can move from a transactional approach of using people from displaced communities to a place of building relationships and being led by their expertise. We have to recognize and compensate them fairly for the essential roles that they play. I hope that you're also curious and will take some action from this webinar today in your context. Maybe you could organize a volunteer day as they did in Malawi. Maybe you could host a workshop and listen to volunteers and even begin to reflect with your colleagues on some of these essential questions. I hope we can make these changes together and I am deeply grateful for everyone who was on this webinar today, for our panelists, and for all of you, especially for the volunteers doing this work. And I really look forward to continuing this conversation within the Alliance and beyond. Thank you, Michelle. Um, thank you so much, Colleen. Uh, thank you for your passion and your dedication to this piece of work. It has been inspiring to support you throughout this, the development of these resources. Um, I would like to, as we're coming to the ending of our time and actually are a little over time, um, I would like to thank everyone who joined us on this launch from many different contexts around the world. Um, I'd like to thank the Alliance, um, BHA, um, PLAN, our facilitators, our, our consultants, um, everyone on this panel for their time and dedication. But most of all, we would like to thank the volunteers who have given so much passion and dedication to the work of supporting children from their communities for driving this work forward. Um, and just thanks to them most of all. Um, from all of us at the Alliance, thank you so much for joining us today and goodbye. <laughs>